Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Adeline. Okay, I think we are good to start and everyone else will keep coming. So without any further delay, uh, over to you, Ivaris and Madeline and your team. Let's start. Okay. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Yeah, we see it. <laughs> okay. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good night, wherever you are. Um, well, um, our group is called Space Influenza, and we're here today to talk about astrovirology. So we're going to start by giving some brief introductions of who we are and what research we're doing and are involved with. So this, so my name is Madeline, first of all. <laughs> and this summer I am researching Haloarchaea, which are microorganisms that really like to live in salt. And one of the places on earth where you find a lot of salt are soda lakes. But um, soda lakes on top of having really high salt concentrations also have really high pH. So anything that wants to live in a soda lake has to withstand really high salt, but also really high pH. So here is a soda lake I have in the picture. Um, and it's in Kenya, Lake Magadai. And a few of the organisms that I'm studying are actually from this lake, which is awesome. And it's pink because of the Haloarchaea living there, which is really cool. So I am looking to see if Haloarchaea that live in soda lakes are any different from the Haloarchaea that don't live in soda lakes, the ones that are neutrophiles. Um, so I'm doing this with a statistical comparison of the genomes of the soda lake Haloarchaea and the non-soda lake Haloarchaea, also known as alkalophiles and neutrophiles. So yeah, that's what I am doing this summer. And so far it's been very interesting and I'm really excited to be here today. Okay, hi, my name is Vicky. I'm a sophomore at UCLA and my project this summer is around gluconeogenesis, which is the opposite of when our body takes the sugars that we consume and makes it into more useful, you know, compounds. So it's making the glucose or the sugar from its own breakdown products, which is possibly what ancient cells did when they had less sugar in the area. So I'm looking into FBPAP, which adds energy to the reaction so that it can actually occur. And it's interesting because it actually does the job of two different enzymes that most living organisms have. And it's very heat stable and is mainly in archaea. It's relatively recent in terms of discovery so it's really exciting and I'm looking into its origins and trying to figure out what it could mean in terms of how early life metabolized when there wasn't much sugar in the area. So hi everyone, I'm really excited to be here and meet all of you guys. Uh, so I'll talk a bit about my research. Uh, basically, I'm from Lithuania. It's a small country in Europe. And what I do there is I study how microgravity uh, affects uh, pathogenic microorganisms that could cause illnesses. And you probably have heard about microgravity and you see the, uh, microgravity affecting astronauts in this picture. So it looks really fun, but sometimes a lot of changes happen to microorganisms and our bodies in these conditions. So I study that. Uh, and as well, um, I'm looking for artificial intelligence applications uh, for life detection, basically to find extraterrestrial life forms. So if you guys have any questions regarding that and regarding what we're further going to discuss, uh, feel free to ask those questions. So that's a bit about my research. Awesome. So today we are going to be asking and hoping to answer a lot of questions. And we're doing this because scientists, as a general rule, ask a lot of questions. Um, and we really want to encourage you guys that anytime we pose a question to raise your hand um, through Zoom and just unmute yourself and give your thoughts. Also feel free to type in the chat. 
Um, but yeah, we want it to really be kind of a discussion with you guys and what you guys think, because a lot of these questions scientists don't have answers to either. So our guiding questions for today, kind of the flow, um, I'm going to be trying to answer what is a virus and are viruses alive? Vicky will be trying to answer if an extraterrestrial virus can infect a human. And Ivaris will be talking about how viruses change in space. Okay, so to start us off, we have a quick poll. So if you wanna scan this QR code or go to menti.com and enter this eight digit code, then you'll be taken to the poll and you can answer the question if you've ever had the flu. I'll give it a bit longer. <laughs> okay, great. Well, four people have had the flu and that is great. Um, well, not for them. Five, wow, we've all had the flu. Okay, great. I've had the flu. Apparently, Ivers and Vicky, they may not be in the poll here today, but I learned the other day they've never had the flu. So they're the outliers here. I thought I was crazy for having had it. Okay. But yeah, so the flu is really common. And so we've all had a virus inside of us at some point. We know how it feels. It's not very fun. Um, but yeah, viruses have affected all of our lives. And I was going to say, even for people who have not had the flu, COVID-19 is a virus and has definitely affected us all very deeply. So it'll be really cool to kind of dive in and see what's going on with these tiny little guys. All right. Great. So what is a virus? Does anyone have an idea? You can raise your hand. Okay. Or you can type in chat. I can't see the chat, but if you're answering there, that's great too. Okay, well, um, scientists have a definition of a virus um, and it's a little complex so we can break it down, but viruses are chemical entities whose genomes replicate inside living cells and can transfer the viral genome to other cells. So uh, viruses are able to take their DNA and put it inside a different host cell or a different cell, something that we would consider alive. And then they can transfer that DNA to a bunch of other cells too. So that's kind of what a virus does. Um, we'll be talking more about it, but this is the scientific definition. So if something's going around doing this thing, we call it a virus. So a really important definition when we're talking about viruses is a virion. Um, and the virion is the passive seed-like form of a virus. So virions, because they're seeds, they're a little more protected than active viruses. And they're able to withstand really extreme environments. So a virion can be frozen and then thawed and still be able to infect people and animal and things, living things. Um, it can also withstand high UV radiation and heat. And again, like still come through those extreme environments and on the other side, be able to infect something. So this means that viruses are really interesting in terms of astrobiology because they can withstand extreme environments and still be able to infect things. So virions have three ingredients. There's the capsid, which I think of like an eggshell, but it's a shell that surrounds the genetic material. So in viruses, you can have different kinds of genetic material. 
So some viruses, um, genetic material is similar to humans and is double-stranded DNA, which you may have heard of before. Um, but some viruses only have single-stranded DNA. And even more interesting, some viruses only have RNA, either double-stranded RNA or single-stranded RNA, um, and no DNA at all. We also have RNA in our bodies, so you may have heard that as well. Um, but it's just really interesting that these viruses are very diverse in terms of just what is even coding the virus to be a virus. Um, and then around all of that is the envelope. Um, and on the envelope, there can be different stamps that help the virus get into certain species. So here's a picture of this so we can kind of visualize. Um, the blue squiggly stuff on the inside is the DNA in this picture, but again, it could be RNA. And then around that DNA, we have the black nucleocapsid, which has nucleo in front of it, but it's a capsid. Um, in this picture, there's a bunch of colorful stuff that they labeled the tegumont. That's just the stuff of the virus pretty much. And then on the outside, we have that lipid envelope and on that envelope, these proteins are the stamps. And so the proteins can help that virus get into specific species and infect them. Okay, so what does a virus do? Um, pretty related to the definition of a virus, but here's the cycle of a virus. So a virion, that seed virus, will bind to a host cell. And then the virus will deliver viral genetic material into the host cell. Then that virus will reprogram the cell to produce more virions. And lastly, those virions are released from the host cell to infect other cells. So that may have been kind of a lot. So I have a quick little video. Um, it's only a minute clip to show you. Can you guys hear it? Sorry, I just want to make sure. No? Okay. <laughs> attaches to a host cell. It often binds to a receptor that this cell has, which gives it access to attach. The virus can inject either its DNA or RNA, depending on what kind of genetic material it has, into the cell. Some types of viruses are actually taken inside the cell themselves. Now, you would think that the cell would notice viral DNA or RNA or an entire virus that has been taken in, but in many cases, it does not. It takes the genetic material from the virus and it starts following the instructions, which in this case is very bad because the instructions tell it to make copies of the virus. The cell uses its own resources to start building. It starts making so many copies of the virus that it can cause the cell membrane of the host to rupture, explode, lice. So what happens is now that these new viral copies, they can get out of the cell and go and infect other cells. This is known as the lytic cycle. By the way, the lysing of the cell membrane is a very bad thing for the cell. The cell cannot survive without its cell membrane. The okay, so hopefully we have an idea of what viruses do. here as well. Stop. Okay, so what does a virus look like? So some of you may have some ideas from the video or from your own like brains. So what do you think a virus looks like? I would like some answers this time. They can look like pretty much anything. Can look like rock. They can look like Blue Origin rocket boosters. They can look like well, COVID. Mm. 
Very true. Well, we'll see. They can look like anything. I like it. Awesome. Does anyone else have ideas? They're like a, a diamond shape. They could be with like, I guess legs would be phalanges or something. I don't mm -hmm. know how to describe the shape. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I do have a name for that shape and I will let you know. Okay. So thank you guys for your ideas. Um, I feel like I just took for granted that viruses existed and never really thought about what they looked like. But when I went into it, it was pretty interesting. So viruses take different shapes for infecting different domains of life, um, which is pretty wild. So in bacteria, they all look like this, which is, I believe, what you just described. And uh, scientists call this the head tail shape of a virus, which makes sense. It looks like a head and a tail. And yeah, those little things on the bottom that, yeah, to me, remind me of like robot legs. I don't know, it just looks like a little robot that's like going around killing things. Um, but yes, so this is the head tail virus. And this is the only shape that exists to infect bacteria, um, which is wild. For eukaryotes, which again, eukaryotes include all plants and animals um, on earth, also some single cell organisms. Um, these are the four different shapes that viruses can take. So we have our head tail viruses again, but we also have just the head running around on the top, this, this one right here. Um, and that's called the icosahedral shape, which yeah, it looks like a bunch of triangles put together. Very fair. So icosahedral is what is the big fancy term. Um, we can also have uh, just circular viruses and blob viruses, <laughs> these amorphous blobs that just go around infecting us. That's what they're called, the blob. So <laughs> very interesting. And then in archaea, we can have all of these different shapes. So I think this is kind of what Weston was talking about. You can have these wild shapes um, infecting our uh, archaea. And so we have the blob again and the head tail virus, but we also have some more interesting shapes in my opinion. Uh, this one here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, hopefully you can. This one's called the glass bottle. So it's just a bottle shape, which is kind of weird. And then this one is two icosahedral viruses stuck together, it looks like. So this dual icosahedral virus going around. To me, it kind of looks like a spaceship. But yeah, there's also just rod shape and this spiral shape. Very, very interesting. So why do you guys think that virus shapes are much more diverse in archaea as opposed to eukaryotes or bacteria? Do you have any ideas? Are they harder to infect? Mm, that's a good guess. I, I'm going to be honest. Scientists are still hypothesizing about this. So any guesses you have are equally valid as to whatever scientists are looking at. So yeah, maybe they're harder to infect. Does anyone else have an idea? Or do you have more ideas? because there's more kinds of archaea, so they have to form more shapes. Maybe, that's cool too. I love both of those ideas. So um, scientists believe perhaps it's because um, archaea are often found in extreme environments. So compared to bacteria and eukaryotes, archaea are more, much more often found in these crazy places where you would never expect life to live. Um, on Earth. So they think that to be able to withstand those extreme environments, um, the viruses took on all these different kinds of shapes uh, that helped them withstand heat or cold or acidic environments, alkalophilic environments, all kinds of stuff. So that's the hypothesis at the moment has yet to be proven. So thank you for sharing. Um, your ideas are interesting as well. And if you want to go study it, you could. So are viruses alive? This is very hot debate right now. 
So we have the definition of a virus. I put the same slide up. But underneath it, I have now put the definition of life. So according to NASA, life is a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. So from what we've already learned, we know that a virus is not self-sustaining. It needs a host cell to infect. It can't just infect into space. <laughs> it needs something to infect. So it is not self-sustaining, but it is a chemical system, uh, but is it capable of evolution? Uh, and scientists believe, or are hypothesizing, that viruses are not only capable of evolution, but are driving evolution on Earth. So some viruses hypothesize that evolution and possibly life as we know it may not be possible without viruses. So maybe without, sorry, without viruses, evolution doesn't exist at all. Um, and there are two big ways that viruses push evolution. So one way is through an arms race, which is a pretty common term. I'm not sure if you've heard of it, but it's basically when different countries stockpile different weapons to keep them safe from the other countries that are also stockpiling weapons. So everyone keeps getting more and more weapons to keep them safe. Um, so it's kind of the same interplay between our host living cells and our viruses. Our hosts are building up their defenses and building up their defenses so that they don't get infected by the viruses. And the viruses have to keep evolving all of these different ways to infect the cell, all these different weapons. So, um, so because of this, it pushes both kinds of life or non-life forms to evolve so that they can infect or not be infected. Um, the other way that viruses drive evolution is they literally introduce new cells or new genes, sorry, new genes into cells and can transfer those genes between cells. And it has been found that some viral genetics are able to help their hosts survive extreme environments better. So, um, so yeah, so viruses are able to just give genetic material for free um, <laughs> that could help these cells in their evolutionary cycle. So scientists, some, a lot of scientists are looking into um, their virus hypotheses about evolution. So one of these hypotheses is that viruses are responsible for the evolution of DNA. Um, and this kind of comes back to, remember when I said that some viruses only have RNA in them? So um, scientists think that at some point, our world only had RNA on it, and it was an RNA world. And that these viruses that only have RNA are kind of the last remaining form from that time. And that viruses were able to help push other forms or life forms and other viruses to, um, to evolve DNA. So very interesting. Um, scientists also think that viruses might have driven the evolution for the three domains and that we couldn't have bacteria, eukarya, and archaea without the viruses. Um, they also think viruses are responsible for the nucleus, which makes sense to me. If you have something that's attacking your DNA all the time, you kind of want to put it in its own separate special nucleus and keep it away from the virus. So, um, so that's one thing. And then also multicellularity. So this also makes sense to me from a protecting yourself standpoint. You know, if we, if I on my own can't defend myself against the virus, maybe if I, you know, bind to my neighbors and become a multicellular glob, the virus will have a harder time. So yes, very crazy. Great. So an interesting fact on top of the evolution is that viruses are able to communicate with one another. And so there was this study done where scientists had these bacteria that were infected by a virus. And the scientists thought going into the experiment that the bacteria would be talking to each other about either dying from the virus um, and you know, oh, like all of these cells are dead over here, so we need to replace them. 
um, or just saying that they're infected and, you know, in some capacity communicating about the this virus that was taking over the bacterial colony. But it turns out um, when the scientists looked in, looked at these bacteria and these viruses that the bacteria were completely quiet and they were not talking to each other at all. However, these viruses were chatting away and they were just having a whole party. So they found out that when a virus infects a bacterial cell, it releases a tiny protein. So this protein is a peptide that is only six amino acids long. So in any given protein in the human genetic um, sphere, uh, we're going to have hundreds of amino acids for each protein, pretty much. So the fact that there's only six amino acids, it's really tiny. I can't stress it enough. It's the tiniest thing. Um, and scientists named it Arbitrium. And this little teeny tiny protein sends out a message to other viruses. And it says, I've taken a victim, which is really dark and scary. But essentially, if it, if more viruses infect more cells, this message gets louder and louder. So I, this I've taken a victim message gets really, really loud. And when it gets to a point that it's deafening, the viruses realize, oh, we need to cool it down. Because if we kill all of the host cells, then we can't live either. They're thinking um, because they need those host cells. So they will cool down their infection rate and let the cells regenerate. And then when that I've taken a victim message becomes quieter, they will then attack. So <sighs> now, so with all of this evidence, um, we are going to you know, talk about our personal opinions on why viruses are alive. So I will have it be known, uh, scientists do not have a clear cut answer on this. They are completely, you know, open to interpretation. They're just kind of like, here's the definition of a virus, here's what it does. We don't really know. So personally, I think that despite all of this evidence, viruses are not alive, they are not self-sustaining, and if they didn't have a life form to infect, they couldn't exist. So I personally believe viruses are not alive. Um, I'm going to let Ivaris share his opinion. Oh, I love a little debate here because uh, <laughs> my opinion is completely different. And I think that viruses are totally alive. And the definition of life is outdated and wrong right now because it says that it has to be self-sustainable. But we already know that there are some bacteria that really need the host cell and it can't live out of it. So, but we still consider bacteria a, a form of life. So I think this is one of the reasons I do believe that viruses are totally alive and maybe they were responsible uh, for the origin of life after all. So I'm on a team alive all the way. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> and then um, I will have Vicky go ahead and share what she thinks. My answer might not be as satisfactory because I think it's a middle ground in that you can't quite classify it as life in the way that we are living or that bacteria would be living. Because when you look at it, it's more like just kind of a complex molecule than it is a cell, which makes it interesting because it does replicate and send messages in ways that regular molecules can't do, which makes me think that maybe it needs to be a new classification, kind of separate to life, but separate to not living, a kind of middle ground that we should classify, especially if we start discovering more similar things in the future, so. Mm. Okay, very thought provoking. So we would like to hear what you have to think. You've heard our opinions. So here's a quick QR code with this. It's the same one um, with the, uh, or you could enter the eight digit code into menti.com. And you can tell us whether you think viruses are alive or not. Who has convinced you? Who is the best debater? We'll see.
Okay, well, interesting. Um, so you guys think yes or yes and no, or I don't know. So no one thinks no, that's okay. I'll lose the debate. That is fine. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah. I think no. You think no? Okay, well, if anyone would like to speak on their opinions and tell us why they chose what they chose, I would, we would love to hear it. Are, so viruses are not self-sustaining, but is life self-sustaining because we need to fuel and eat? And does us eating other life, like plants and other animals and stuff, count as being self-sustaining still? Because if it doesn't, then we aren't self-sustaining. Mm. And so we don't fit the definition of life. That's a very fair point. I, in my head, when I was thinking self-sustaining, I was on the side of reproduction. So we can just freely reproduce humans um, without needing, well, I guess you do need two different kinds of humans. Okay, fair point, fair point, well made. Um, I, I don't really understand exactly what the definition is when they mean self-sustaining. I know with viruses, they're talking about needing a host cell, but you make a fair point that is any life self-sustaining other than photosynthetic, synthetic organisms? They just need the sun. Um, may I elaborate on my answer as well? Yes, of course, please. Um, I said yes and no, because I feel like viruses, when they're not infecting a human, like if they're on a surface, they have nothing to reproduce with. They're not really alive. It's not like viruses crawl to search your body and like crawl into your systems. Um, but once they get into your cells, then they sort of like wake up and start reproducing and doing a bunch of bad to your body. I feel like that's why I chose yes and no. Mm, I like it. Thank you. That's a great point. Would anyone else like to speak? Okay. Well, if not, thank you all so much for completing the poll at least or sharing your opinion out loud. I appreciate both. Okay. So just to wrap up this intro section um, and get you familiar with viruses, um, here's some interesting virus facts. So viruses outnumber cellular, cellular life forms on our planet by at least 10 times. On average, one bacterial cell is infected by 10 viral species, which makes sense with the last point. But yeah, a lot of viruses roaming around, insane numbers, definitely more than stars in the sky. Um, viruses have been found in all environments where life has been found on Earth. And uh, virus genomes have recently been coined biological dark matter or the dark matter of the biosphere. And this is because when we take a virus and we sequence its genome, about 70 to 80% of those genes, we have no idea what they're coding for or what they're doing. It's completely a mystery to us. We only know 20 to 30% of what goes on with our virus genomes. And that number is completely polar opposite when we uh, sequence any cellular life forms. When we sequence those genomes, we know and understand 70 to 80% of those genes and 20 to 30 are still a mystery. So because we are so in the dark when it comes to virus genomes and what they're doing and how they're doing it, uh, yeah, scientists are calling it the biological dark matter um, or dark matter of the biosphere. So I thought that was very interesting and a cool thing. And with that, we're going to take a quick break um, and when we come back, it will be Vicky's turn to talk about extraterrestrial viruses infecting humans. Um, let's do 10 minutes. So we'll be back at 45, whatever hour 45 for you. Um, and if you have any questions, I will be here. And Ivers and Vicky will be here as well for the 10 minute break. But yeah, use this time to go to the bathroom, get a snack.
and thank you. I wasn't able to read any of the chat while I was presenting. So I'm reading it now and thank you all for, <laughs> for being involved and commenting. You're very, <laughs> you're very silly and fun. <laughs> I'm like laughing, so.
Okay, so we'll come back in about one minute, just so you guys know. Okay, so uh, welcome back everyone from the break. Uh, let's transition back into the lesson and learn a little bit more about viruses in space. So I am going to answer the question of, could an extraterrestrial or alien virus infect a human? So there isn't actually lots of direct research on this topic because we haven't actually found an alien virus yet but looking at how viruses change species here on earth we can kind of make an educated guess so let's look at some important details first assuming that an alien virus has the same host switching rules as an earth virus would so how do viruses change hosts within a species like person to person Viruses are often transferred by infected bodily fluids, like the tiny droplets of saliva in your breath or when you sneeze, or through blood and infected needles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is why masks are really important because one's nose and mouth are the major entry points for a virus to enter your body, which means that it's really important to kind of block it off so that the virus doesn't have any chance to enter your body unless you get the virus on your hands and, you know, rub your eyes or put your hand in your mouth or something. So otherwise it would enter the host body and begin infection. Before it begins infection though, it would have to overcome the immune system, which is basically our body being like, wait a second, there's something here that isn't supposed to be there. And it detects germs or pathogens, viruses and whatnot. And it deploys white blood cells to try to fight them off so that we don't actually have to get sick. So if the virus survives the immune system, then it can actually, as Madeline said, uh, trick a cell into reproducing the virus several times so that it can spread far enough so that the immune system struggles to actually fight it with white blood cells alone and the infection establishes. And that's usually when we start feeling symptoms like fever, chills, nausea, exhaustion, and whatnot for fevers and influenza and cold and whatnot. So viruses are very specialized. They have special proteins to bind with the host cells that allow the virus to start hijacking that specific cell. It's kind of like if a cell for a worm had a triangle stuck at the end of it, a triangle protein, and the worm cell had a triangle keyhole. And then if a human virus came in with say, a rectangle protein, they wouldn't be able to fit in and the virus wouldn't be able to attach to the cell. So the worm's immune system would just get rid of it and it wouldn't be able to really start an infection. This way it's very specialized for the host species. So that's a very important thing to remember when we consider on whether or not an alien virus could infect us. So foreign earth viruses like animal viruses do infect us, but because they're specialized, they often can't just directly jump from the animal to us. For one thing, they would need lots of exposure to have the chance to change in the correct way, or they would need to jump from a similar species first so that a very different species can infect us if they go to slightly different to slightly different to slightly different until it gets to a completely different species like us. Isolated infections do happen, but they don't tend to spread much. Oftentimes when there's an isolated infection, it's just where the virus happened to latch on or the immune system wasn't strong enough to fight it off. 
but the virus itself can't repeat the mutation or reproduce itself enough to spread to further people of the species. Continued contact with the virus or the host species of the virus could allow for more chances for the virus to change, which does make it more likely for an actual infection to happen in humans. Obviously, animal viruses are an issue in human population. It is a big thing that we experience a decent amount because we have so many animals and like Madeline said, so many viruses all the time coming into contact. Uh, so for one thing, COVID-19 was previously in like bats and other animals and animal viruses are actually kind of a big deal for us, like AIDS, SARS, bubonic plague, uh, influenza originally, I think, came from animals in 1918. So a lot of our pandemics occur when an animal virus just come, totally takes us by surprise and our bodies don't know how to handle it. Again, though, exposure is very important because if there's limited contact, the virus doesn't actually have a very good chance of getting that lucky spot of being able to attach to ourselves. So uh, it's pretty unlikely for it to actually infect us. However, like I mentioned, it can jump from similar species because if they're more genetically similar then that protein keyhole thing are relative, would be relatively similar as well. So for one thing, the Nipah virus went from bats to humans through pigs as a middle species because humans were planting fruit trees on their farms that attracted the fruit bats. And the bats unfortunately infected a bunch of the pigs who infected the humans, especially because the humans may not have interacted with the bats directly, but the bats interacted with the pigs when they were stealing the fruit and the pigs interacted with the humans because they were livestock and also because humans sent out pork to be eaten and the pork was unfortunately sometimes infected. This also shows how human activity does infect, does affect whether or not animal viruses can get to us. So it's another thing we'd have to be careful of when we go to space is like if we're planting stuff a lot in space and there are alien species, they might be attracted to our plants and accidentally infect us. There are three main stages of successful switching between species. The first, as I already mentioned, is an isolated like single infection of a new host and it doesn't actually infect anyone else. This is known as a dead end host because the virus doesn't actually manage to go anywhere with it. It's just a random, anomaly, a person just happens to get infected somehow and it starts and ends with them. Then another stage is local chains of infections where more people start to be infected and it does spread a little bit, but it is snuffed out before it can actually become a, a serious variation. The variation doesn't actually manage to spread much before it's faded out within the bodies of the people who have it. So this is just like a little outbreak, you know? a little flu season within a tiny town. The last stage where it's officially jumped species and moved from say a worm to us or a pig to us would be sustained movement between hosts. Like if multiple humans are infecting each other and it's never fully gone, like the virus, there's constantly someone being kind of infected, then there is officially a strain of virus out there reproducing itself that is specific to humans but that is generally the same virus that the animals had. It just mutated itself so that it could now infect us as well. So this is just a quick video to summarize what I've already said in case any of it was kind of confusing and then also transition us into the next bit about how viruses can evade the immune system and how it depends on genetic similarities and just random lottery luck to be able to make it from an animal to a human. Viruses have evolved specific interactions with their host species. Human flu viruses are covered in proteins adapted to bind with matching receptors on human respiratory cells. Once inside a cell, the virus employs additional adaptations to hijack the host cell's reproductive machinery and replicate its own genetic material. Now, the virus only needs to suppress or evade the host's immune system long enough to replicate to sufficient levels and infect more cells. At this point, the flu can be passed on to its next victim via any transmission of infected bodily fluid. 
However, this simple sneeze also brings the virus in contact with pets, plants, or even your lunch. Viruses are constantly encountering new species and attempting to infect them. More often than not, this ends in failure. In most cases, the genetic dissimilarity between the two hosts is too great. For a virus adapted to infect humans, a lettuce cell would be a foreign and inhospitable landscape. But there are a staggering number of viruses circulating in the environment, all with the potential to encounter new hosts. And because viruses rapidly reproduce by the millions, they can quickly develop random mutations. Most mutations will have no effect or even prove detrimental, but a small proportion may enable the pathogen to better infect a new species. The odds of winning this destructive genetic lottery increase over time, or if the new species is closely related to the virus's usual host. For a virus adapted to another mammal, infecting a human might just take a few lucky mutations. And a virus adapted to chimpanzees, one of our closest genetic relatives, might barely require any changes at all. It takes more than time and genetic similarity for a host jump to be successful. Some viruses come equipped to easily infect a new host's cells, but are then unable to evade an immune response. Others might have a difficult time transmitting to new hosts. For example, they might make the host's blood contagious, but not their saliva. However, once a host jump reaches the transmission stage, the virus becomes much more dangerous. Now gestating within two hosts, the pathogen has twice the odds of mutating into a more successful virus. And each new host increases the potential for a full-blown epidemic. Virologists are constantly looking for mutations that might make viruses such as influenza more likely to jump. However, predicting the next potential epidemic is a major challenge. There's a huge diversity of viruses that we're only just beginning to uncover. Researchers are tirelessly studying the biology of these pathogens, and by monitoring populations to quickly identify new outbreaks, they can develop vaccines and containment protocols to stop these deadly diseases. Okay, how exactly do vaccines... Okay, so as it showed in the video, uh, a really important thing is like, uh, animal viruses do jump a lot, although it's relatively rare, but since there's so many animal viruses, then it's like, it seems common to us. But virologists are constantly monitoring like the stage two, where there are little outbreaks and whatnot, because obviously we would really like to prevent it from becoming a full-blown disease among the human population. So that's actually also really interesting is that we're constantly monitoring which viruses are mutating and how, and whether or not that can allow it to get into us, you know? So, cool, I think. Viruses have evolved specific. So, uh, if you could just go to polev.com uh, and, you know, respond to this, it's really just a fancy way of asking, what do you guys think is the biggest part of whether or not a virus can jump from an an uh, animal to us. You can also respond in the chat or raise your hand and mute yourself. Just talk about it based on what we've just talked about. There isn't technically, there isn't, I think, one set answer based on my research. I think they're all very important, so. Oh, I just checked the chat. Aria, we inhale, we exhale um, with our breath. Well, like, you know, gases and whatnot, but we also exhale saliva, which has a bunch of germs and bacteria and viruses and stuff, which is why we can't, which is why during things like COVID, we can't just go around breathing on other people because we would transmit the viruses that we have. Yeah, all of the above is a, <laughs> good answer so let's just move on uh yeah i would say probably all of the above although contact length is probably i would say one of the bigger ones because 
there are such low chances that the mutation that would allow it to enter the human would occur because the viruses can't necessarily detect or spontaneously change themselves into what could infect us. It's just kind of totally random chance. So uh, based on that, I wanted to have a little discussion as a transition of, do you guys think an alien virus then, not of this earth, could infect us? If we were to like colonize space and start living there and whatnot, would we be infected by alien viruses? So please unmute yourself. I strongly encourage you to say something, put it in the chat, raise your hand. Um, oh, sorry, I don't know why the poll's not working. Um, but please raise your hand and we can just discuss if the polls, yeah, it doesn't matter anyways. Uh, yeah, Brenna. Okay, so in the video, it mentioned that um, viruses can have a hard time moving from one cell to like a completely different cell. They use the lettuce cell as an example. So um, seeing if an alien um, virus could infect us really depends on what an alien cell looks like. If it's any way similar to ours, um, then I think the virus could easily infect us. Um, but if the alien cell is like completely different than ours, then it probably wouldn't be able to. I think that's a really good point. A big part of it would be if the alien virus could even like navigate its way through us and, and impact any of our cells. Quinn? Um, so how would... Oh, sorry, uh, if... Weston, do you want to say something? Oh, yeah. Um... I think it's very unlikely because it would need to have our DNA or our, it would have to have DNA or RNA and it would have to have it very close, very similar to us. And the chance of that is virtually zero. That's also a good point because we wouldn't share a common ancestor with the aliens. Quinn, did you want to say something? Sorry. What if they have a completely different way of infecting instead of having proteins, they, when they get into the body, they explode and their internal, um, I guess, DNA and RNA disperse into the body instead of taking over a cell. That's also a really good point. I know I keep saying that, but you guys are coming up with really good things. I mean, because we have never discovered an alien virus, so this is all working on the assumption that it's going to look like ours. But in reality, we don't know that for sure. So Quinn has a point that maybe it might infect differently or it might invade cells differently and just be like a new kind of virus somehow. And in that way, then it might be more or less likely to infect us based on that. So I think, could an alien virus infect us? Yes but I do think it would be very unlikely, mainly because there would be really big genetic differences. The alien virus would probably look considerably different from our viruses. We've already seen that based on uh, what organisms they're made to infect and based on what conditions that organism is in, they have multiple different shapes, they look different, they have different surface proteins, and even with those, all of those living organisms that have all of those different viruses that are completely separated, all have a common ancestor on Earth, LUCA, the last universal common ancestor. And even between us and a very distant species would be similar because we, uh, if we have an animal, we at least have a eukaryotic common ancestor, even closer than LUCA. So an alien would not have that common ancestor. So our DNA would, even if they do have DNA like ours, the DNA would look very different probably. It would really, it, we have no guarantees that the alien cell would look anything like ours. And in fact, it would be kind of coincidental, I think, if it did, if life formed exactly the same way that it did here on Earth. However, even if the chance is like 0. point like zero 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 so on one, then if we lived there for a long time, it wouldn't be completely impossible. And the longer we expose ourselves to a virus, the more chances the alien virus would have maybe to coincidentally mutate in that specific way that would allow us to 
actually get the infection and allow the viruses to actually get a hold of uh, enough of our cells to establish something. I have a question. Why do why does every green big heads? Sorry, I you were cutting out a little bit. Was your question why are aliens usually depicted as like little green men with like oval heads? Yeah. yeah. I think it's because yeah. we what uh, I think it's because we uh, have never seen an alien before. And like a long time ago, when people were first like, whoa, Martians, you know, uh, we now know there are little green men all over Mars. But the concept of Martians came up as this, somebody just designed them as like, what if there were little green humanoid people on another planet? And everyone was like, wow, what if there were little green humanoid people on other planets? So... And then because of that, whenever we think of aliens, we think of that original concept. But in reality, if we were to see an alien species, we kind of expect it to be a cell. Although it would be super cool if it was a multicellular organism and it was something like a space cow or, you know, something like that. I think that would be super cool if it wasn't a if cell or if it was a little green man. But cool. What? If it, could, if it could communicate with us, that'd be cool. That would be cool. Although... Uh, if it made noises to communicate, that would be cool, but then we'd have to have uh, xenolinguists or uh, people who can study the alien language so that we can translate and kind of get a Rosetta Stone translator dictionary for us to be able to communicate with the aliens. So really good questions. Uh, probably they would not look like little green men. It's incredibly unlikely that they are, right? but they would actually. So. To consider though what the chances that we will be infected are though, we also have to consider what human behavior would be because we wouldn't just be standing around on a planet, right? Just like bare, bare skin, just touching viruses all over the place, hoping that it'll infect us. In reality, we'd probably have spacesuits because a lot of the planets don't have atmospheres. Although the ones that we might go out to colonize might, but they would be really far away. So if we were to start living on Mars or something uh, and a virus were to develop or be discovered there, we would be in spacesuits. And since air can't go through the suit, the vi viruses wouldn't be able to enter in through any infected fluids or anything. So it would be very difficult for the viruses to infect us. It would be worse if we discovered an alien species and started keeping it as like a pet or livestock, because then we might take the pet into our little space homes. And we might have oxygen in those homes and take off our space suits and whatnot. And then we would have direct contact with the host of the virus. Uh, currently though, even if an astronaut does bring the virus back to the shuttle, there would be very limited transmission, not only because the chances that the astronaut would be infected and infect other people is incredibly low, but also because currently space travel is really slow. We don't have like, Star Trek light speeds going on yet. So it would just infect the other people of the shuttle and something would tip them off. If it was actually being an infection, the chances are that at least one person on the shuttle would have symptoms. And then people back on earth and people in the shuttle would be like, rut row, something's not right here. It will be worse if in the future we had earth-like contacts because things like COVID vaccine, the COVID, virus spread very easily because there are constantly planes going all over the place. It's millions of people going continent to continent, country to country every single day. So if we had spaceships constantly going from planet to planet and the spaceships could arrive very quickly so we couldn't actually tell if somebody had been infected yet, then it would be more likely because the viruses would have more of a chance to infect more people in different conditions and maybe be able to get that lucky mutation to actually start infecting more people. Yeah, I have an opinion that if we go colonize another planet, it, there should be, you should not be allowed to take any COVID with like, you have to like be quarantined yet. You get new, you get new clothes and new everything's to take. You, uh, you have to, you have to have the vaccine. You have to be tested negative a ton. Like, I think Yeah, that's actually, we are also very careful. I will talk about that as well. Uh, to not bring Earth viruses to other planets either, because I really if, want because if Mars can be free of COVID, then that'd be awesome. Since I don't think COVID is going to go 
away in the next few, few decades, it's always going to be around like the flu. Uh, yeah, like Miss Brodsky says in the chat, um, astronauts are quarantined prior to and often after for a little bit their flights before we can really tell to make sure that like they didn't accidentally bring anything that we couldn't see. So I wanted to touch on what an alien virus would actually do to us because it's interesting to think about like in these TV shows or cartoons or something like that when somebody is infected with an alien virus they might pop up in purple hives or like randomly sprout tentacles or antenna or something like that but in reality our bodies have specific ways of handling unknown viruses and pathogens so it probably wouldn't actually look very differently than a severe virus from earth like if somebody is struck really hard by the flu or if there is a random alien virus that starts infecting humans and our bodies don't yet know how to deal with it so in reality we would probably just have intense headaches fevers chills exhaustion and nausea as our body tries to pump up the heat to burn out the virus and starts directing all of its energy to fending it off rather than energy for like exercise or moving around and whatnot. Uh, I don't know if for some reason the polls aren't working and I don't have time currently to fix it because it was working earlier, but just unmute yourselves and talk about uh, please, if we were to colonize space and start living there, what measures do you think we should take to try to prevent alien viruses? Like if we had little towns in another planet, what what should you think we should do to make sure that we don't infect the vi get infected by the viruses or start transmitting it all over the place like it does here on Earth? Maybe have more frequent like health checkups with people if we should have a stationed um doctor or medical person um on site so maybe you have like weekly checkups just to make sure no one's infected and if they are then i don't know uh quarantine or keep them away from the rest of the civilization mm. That's a good idea, kind of similar to uh, what we do on Earth to make sure if you're infected, sorry, but you got to like stay away until your virus clears up. Uh, Brenna? Um, maybe for the first couple of months living on another planet, we could keep, everyone could keep on a spacesuit or at least some kind of face covering um, more than just a mask, like, in, like a, your own air supply inside of it. Um, and then after, after that couple of months goes by, the majority of viruses will probably be gone, but we can like make some plants to filter the air or just find other ways to clean out the air and the land. Yeah, that's smart that we, I think we'd have to really make sure that we don't bring anything back with us. So, uh, Aria? I just thought of something else to add to my uh, little health checkup idea. Maybe having like a medical person would put that person in danger. So what if you have some sort of device on everybody that like automatically checks the person's body so you can just do everything electronically? Oh, that would be an interesting invention like a device that kind of regularly tests the blood to see if there's any sort of unknown virus so that before you even really become contagious, uh, you can tell that you're infected, which would be actually super useful because usually by the time we realize that somebody's infected with a virus, be it the flu or like an animal virus infected it or probably an alien virus, they're already contagious to other people. So Quinn? I know this might be a little far off, but it's gonna be a while until we start living in space anyway. Maybe some system where humans, humans have to sleep. So maybe while you are sleeping, there is a, some sort of thing to scan you um, or decontaminate you so that every time, every night, it's a new cycle of you're decontaminated so that you can't affect anything. So anything you did anything anyone had come in contact with is eliminated so that in the morning they can start over again. 
Mm. That's also really smart. You guys should be inventors. That would be really useful if we had consistent de decontamination processes, which we do kind of already have for astronauts, but uh, not quite for anyone in space already, because like Quinn pointed out, it is kind of a ways away, but it's good to start thinking about it now, I think. So we do already have what I'd like to call just in case protocols. Even though we haven't discovered an alien virus or alien life or anything like that, we're actually already taking action to not be infected. So we're considering both backward and forward contamination. Backward being if we accidentally bring uh, alien toxins or chemicals that are somehow unique to another planet to Earth and it starts messing things up. Uh, and forward is if we accidentally bring Earth toxins and start spreading it on another planet. With viruses, it would be as if we ran into an alien and the alien sneezed on us, that would be backward contamination and gross. And if we sneeze on the alien, that would also be, that would be rude for one thing. And that would be forward contamination because we would be just directly sneezing our viruses onto the alien. Yeah. So uh, the alien sneezing onto us, that can't be considered rude because, um, because, um, because, well, different customs different planets, different customs, different universes, different galaxies, whatever. That's true, but us sneezing on the alien would be rude uh -huh. because we do have that idea. We wouldn't know if the aliens know what viruses are and that therefore sneezes are bad. Well, they're not bad. If you sneeze on another person, it's bad. Uh, so the alien might not know that, but if you choose to sneeze on another person, you know, apologize. That's not nice. Uh, so there's actually already been stuff done Already in 2016, there was a three-day workshop titled The Planetary Protection Knowledge Gaps for Human Extraterrestrial Missions, which is really just a fancy, you know, scientist way of saying, how do we protect ourselves? People from all over the world gathered to talk about the transfer of germs and materials between planets and what we can do to make sure that when astronauts come back and when we have samples from space, like moon rocks or uh, pieces of ice that we believe might have living organisms in it, how we treat that to make sure that it does not spread and contaminate Earth and to make sure that we don't spread and contaminate anything on another planet, especially in case there are living things there. We don't want to mess up their ecosystem. So all the way even in 1967 during the space race, which if you don't know is when the US and Russia were kind of competing to see who could get to the moon first. Uh, there was an outer space treaty that they and a bunch of other countries signed that has a section clarifying that all signed nations must take every possible measure against contaminations. So as of 2021, the majority of countries, 111 countries have fully joined into it, which means that most countries that might go into space would already be taking every possible precaution. So we wouldn't quite have to worry about that yet. Uh, but especially when we're colonizing there, we'd have to start developing new priorities and new processes because currently our processes are mainly, if an astronaut comes back, keep them quarantined, you know, like scan them to make sure that they don't have anything on them. But currently that's good because we're already taking steps, even though we haven't discovered anything suspicious, but always better safe than sorry. Okay, so again, I don't know why the poll's not working, but feel free to raise your hand. I would really like to hear, knowing all of this, if we were um, colonizing another planet and you were offered a chance to live there, but we knew that alien viruses were there, would you still want to live on the planet or would you not want to take the risk? I think my gut instinct would be, yes, I would love to live on another planet, but it would be, I guess, even though it's incredibly statistically unlikely, a little risky, so. It's an interesting thought. Quinn? Well, first, I think there's a, the positive of living on another planet here massively outweighs the negative. But also, it also could be a positive if there are viruses there because you could somehow maybe spread immunity if you become immune to that. And there are multiple peop people there that become immune to it and spread those immunities hmm. over time. Yeah, we'd, so we have to be really careful if we 
if we are colonizing planets with viruses on them, we should, you know, try to figure that out. Maybe get an alien vaccine set up. Uh, Brianna, Brianna, sorry. I think I want to live there for a little while, but after a couple weeks, I would be afraid that the viruses might have like changed to be able to infect human cells, um, like another strand of the virus or something. So I probably wouldn't want to live there for that long. Yeah, that's that's a good idea. So then you wouldn't have enough uh, exposure with the virus so that you probably wouldn't get sick. That's smart. Just like vacation in another planet, occasionally stopping by, see what's up. Aria? Um, I do agree. I probably would live on another planet. I mean, that's a once in a lifetime opportunity. Well, maybe it isn't in the future, but it sounds like one right now. Um, but I feel like it depends on what the virus does to my body. Like if it's just, if you get infected by it and you have a little fever or something, then maybe I would be less scared and more, less reluctant. But if it has super large repercussions on your body, like you can almost die, then that would be kind of scary. Yeah, that's true. Viruses have differing effects. So if it was like super contagious and had lasting effects like maybe COVID did, then we should be more careful about that. Uh, Brenna, did you have something else to say or did you just not put your hand up? Nope, that was it. Okay. So that's really interesting. I think you all made very good points. I think I would live on another planet, but I would be paranoid, especially as a bit of a germaphobe. I'd constantly just be like, mm. <laughs> but I'd assume at that point, we'd probably have a lot of virologists and interested people keeping an eye on the virus and studying it and constantly checking its mutations to make sure that if it does mutate and get to humans, it doesn't fully catch us by surprise. And with that, there is another break. So see you again in 10 minutes. I think we'll take five minutes this time, if that's okay for you guys. I'll have a lot of talking there to the audience. Yeah, that's nice then. So see you guys after five minutes.
Okay, so let's just give it like one more minute and we'll start with my section. Okay, so I think we can go on and this section uh, will uh, somehow uh, conclude all of the information that you guys have received before, but it will be presented in some different way. I really want you to communicate just like you communicated um, until now. It was really nice to get your idea, so I, uh, so I hope you'll get uh, and bring more ideas uh, right now too. But my section will be constructed as a story and I want you all to be storytellers with me. So we're going to talk about what happens to viruses in space or what basically viruses do in space. What would they do if they would go to space or just be in space conditions? So uh, to start a story, uh, we will imagine that there are two viruses. So I want you to be as creative as you can be because uh, there are no wrong answers right now. Scientists haven't studied viruses a lot in space. They have just studied them a bit in International Space Station, but basically we don't know what would happen to viruses on other planets and things like that. So I want you to be as creative Maybe I'll research some of those ideas in my lab one day. So let's imagine that those two viruses, um, uh, one of them is happy and another one is sad. And I'll quickly tell you why they could be happy or sad. A happy virus lives on Earth and a sad virus lives on a very distant planet somewhere in another um, maybe galaxy. It could be anywhere in space far, far from Earth. So both of these viruses uh, somehow in the meantime want to become astronauts. Uh, so we will going to unravel how did that happen, how these viruses became astronauts, even though they were each um, e either happy or sad before. So in order uh, to keep moving with the story, of course, we need some background information that we're going to use. And so for a bit, let's keep our characters, the happy and the sad virus, um, in a corner a bit, and they shouldn't replicate in the virtual world, so we won't be scared here. Let's keep them a bit, and I'll tell you some background information on what happens to humans and what we already know about space. So first of all, uh, let's think about this earthly virus uh, that has evolved an Earth. Uh, I'm going to tell you a bit of the evolutionary context for this virus. So it has these viruses basically on Earth have been evolving for 3.8 or somewhat a billion years. So it's a long time. But during this time, they have all been experiencing constant gravity. They haven't experienced microgravity or hypogravity. It's been a constant gravity just like it is right now. Uh, they have been protected by... Um, um, they have been protected against magnetic fields uh, because we have an atmosphere here that protects us. Um, it protects us from space and outer radiation as well. So what it means to a virus. So we know and we have already heard that some of the viruses can mutate and they mutate because of these harsh conditions sometimes. So in Earth, um, we have quite mild conditions there and viruses uh, might have been living happily there. That's why they might be happy because there weren't a lot of radiation that could cause random mutations and, and, and make viruses evolve into even different forms. So it, it caused that earthly viruses have this limited genetic diversity. Even though we have seen that there are many forms, they could look like anything basically there are so many forms it's still considered a limited genetic diversity because they didn't experience much of harsh condition conditions before so this is the evolutionary context that we have 
uh, for Earth conditions. And when we think about space, you know, humans didn't want to travel to space um, just when they uh, started um, getting the intelligence and, and started thinking when uh, the species evolved basically into intelligent ones, we weren't thinking about space. And this was mainly because of the fear of unknown. We didn't know what happens in space. And even 100 years ago, people thought that their blood would boil in space. They would freeze to death in space. They didn't know anything about uh, costume spacesuits. So this is where this was a lot of uh, there were a lot of unknown conditions that we were basically just scared of. So the first thing you remember that we have sent to space was um, a dog and we just wanted to test it on other species. But viruses, let's think that viruses were fearless all the way and maybe they have been traveling in between um, uh, space and Earth for a longer time. So viruses uh, shouldn't care about their blood boiling up, you know, there's just genetic material. So right now, uh, when scientists have understood that we can overcome space conditions, we have spacesuits, uh, we have um, life um, um, sustainable machinery that can just help us survive in space conditions. So now uh, everyone, uh, all the scientists, astrobiologists are just studying how life uh, it behaves in different levels. So we can study life at the level of cells. We can study life in space at the level of tissues, organs. We can even study uh, little rats or mice or um, other um, animals in space conditions. So we already, already know that uh, and we have studied that and this helps us to unravel mechanisms. But one thing actually hasn't been studied a lot. So this is viruses. That's why we're going to create a story that is like really creative. I want you get to, to get. I want you to get uh, creative as much as possible, just because it hasn't been studied yet. And maybe you can bring up some amazing ideas. It would help us to bring the future because understanding what would viruses do in space uh, would really mean a lot to astronauts and their health because we don't know what happens to astronauts if viruses come there. So one of the main conditions that I have to tell you about is weightlessness. I have already mentioned that I do research in microgravity. So I study how microorganisms um, behave at, in simulated microgravity conditions in my laboratory. But in space, we all experience um, microgravity. So microgravity does a lot of things. You've probably heard about a lot of them. It gives astronauts altered shape. Uh, for example, hate, uh, we become higher in space conditions in microgravity, but we also lose bone tissue, we lose a lot of muscle mass, uh, which leads to think that we always have to exercise, constantly exercise to keep these things. So we also experience, astronauts experience altered senses, they have altered um, um, hearing, altered uh, sight, and these things are really harsh. So we uh, astronauts just don't know why that happens. There are some conditions that might cause that. One of them is, of course, as I mentioned, microgravity, space radiation, and others. But the ultimate thing is that we have weakened immune system. And we already know that these viruses can shut down our immune system a bit. And if microgravity shuts our immune system even more, viruses might be very, very dangerous. So how, uh, if, if so many things happen to humans, how will our viruses astronauts survive? So now I want you to um, create our characters together. And first of all, we will create the character of the happy earthly virus. So what do you guys think? Why would, what would make this earthly virus happy? Why would he love uh, living on earth? Do you have any ideas? You can just like raise your hand and tell it. I probably don't see you raising hands, but uh, but you can write it in chat. I see the chat too. Okay, Quinn has a, a, a really good idea. They have things to infect. Yeah, this is one of the reasons why they are happy. Are there any other things that you guys can come up with? This should really make an earthly virus happy, having things to infect. Nice environment. Yeah, basically, uh, just like I mentioned, no radiate, no no radiation. We're protected. We have an atmosphere, so an earthly virus might be happy, just because of the environment. 
more viruses to communicate with that with that's really nice uh because yeah yeah that's a really nice thing uh because communication is key for us humans and maybe viruses are just some kind of life form that also love communication uh, communication and they have a lot of viruses to communicate to here no virus killers that's also a point we don't have a lot of virus killers just vaccines you know okay so um Let's move to another thing. These were all nice uh, thoughts that you have mentioned. Now let's build the character of a sad extraterrestrial virus. Uh, this is, uh, now you, you just have to get like created. So what happens if this virus is living on, for example, it's distant icy body, it's in permafrost, why would he be sad? What could be the reasons? There might be some opposite reasons, no atmosphere, yeah. It could make this a virus sad, has nothing to infect, correct. Stuck in passive state, yeah, it might, if it's in permafrost, it might not be evolving at all. It might not be getting any mutations. It is just like inactivated. No diversity, not able to reproduce, so will eventually die. It's bored, exactly. I think it would be totally bored. It has nothing to do. What would you do in a very distant, harsh planet? Uh, so yeah, it might just be bored. It, it might be one of the main reasons you get sad. And that happens to us humans as well. Okay, do you have, if you want, if you guys want to raise your hands or just uh, put on uh, your mic and, 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 and tell an idea, you can also do that. But I think we've got some characters here and we understand what would make these viruses happy and sad. So I've also portrayed um, their characters and some of the traits of them. Uh, so I thought that the happy virus is happy just because he has a lot of friends. And imagine coronaviruses right now, they, that's a party, that's totally a party. The uh, happy virus is protected by mother earth, just like you guys told completely correct atmosphere and other things there are many possible hosts uh, and a sad virus is lonely it's not protected by atmosphere uh, it has an overload of radiation it could have an environment of hypogravity or microgravity it could be experiencing heavy bombardment you know uh, and uh, it would make a virus sad um, yeah, and true, coronaviruses are party people. Um, I do believe that's why they're happy because they have a lot of friends here. Um, and the coronaviruses don't respect social distancing and spend a bunch of time around their virus friends. Uh, these things, uh, we, we, we have kind of a movie going on here in this scenario, so that's really nice. So let's move on with the story. Um, the journey of an earthly virus, we're going to back to the earthly virus. The journey of it wasn't the most pleasant one um, because imagine that the happy virus was born here. What we see here is a primordial soup. Uh, there are many earthquakes, earthquakes happening, hot temperatures, um, acid lakes, lightnings all around. Uh, what if that earthly virus was experiencing all of these things? It was really harsh. It, it should have been hard for a happy virus. But you know that one of the theories about origins of life are connected um, to, to, to these conditions. So in the previous lectures, you have probably heard about RNA world um, uh, hypothesis. You probably heard about metabolism first. So RNA world says that we had enzymes, but they were not stable. So maybe it's not the correct hypothesis, but it has many advantages as well. Metabolism says that proteins were more uh, stable. We could store information as well in some ways, but none of these uh, hypotheses are proven uh, to the end point. So maybe there was a mixed hypothesis and astrovirology uh, could uh, possibly hold the key because uh, just like Madeline mentioned at the very beginning of our lecture, uh, she said that uh, they are uh, the viruses are the drivers for evolution. What if they connected the, uh, these two hypotheses of RNA world and metabolism world and made um, life emerge? So this might be the reason the virus is happy. Uh, so some of you in the chat, we have already uh, talked about that uh, in the chat a bit um, about what, what good could a virus do. 
So if you have any ideas, you can just write them in chat. But usually there's a bunch of Latin words. They don't mean anything. But if we could translate something in English and write a list, it could be as long here. Uh, that there are many bad things that an earthly virus has done before. And it, it killed a lot of people. Many viruses killed a lot of people. But we never mentioned the good things. So one of the good things is a possibility for the origin of life. Another good thing that has been already proven uh, is that the placenta, uh, the evolution of placenta, it, it came up just because of viruses. They played a huge role in, in this game. So there's some, there are so many good things that viruses could do, uh, but um, we just don't know about them. And going on with the story, people didn't understand anything before about the good things. And this is the reason they have sent an earthly virus to space. Let's imagine it happened. People thought the viruses are just bad and we send them to space. So uh, what do you guys think? I want to ask you one question. What could have happened to this happy earthly virus if he was sent to space? If you want to raise your hand, uh, you can do that. I'm looking through the chat. Are there any ideas what would happen? OK, the loss of gravity had no effect because it's too small. That's an interesting point. Uh, but dust particles are also very small but they're affected by uh, the loss of gravity. Actually, in space conditioning, in the International Space Station, these particles of dust uh, uh, just move up and they can um, alter our sight. They can damage our eyes. Of course, viruses are much, much smaller. We have big, bigger viruses as well. Yeah, the viruses are much smaller than dust particles, but we have some big ones. I don't remember the exact name. You could uh, find that, but there are bigger ones as well. So yeah, it, 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 it might happen that nothing, um, space conditions didn't alter the life of this happy virus. It could be a possibility. It could be a possibility. But another thing, remember we also talked about in chat about reactivation and superpowers. So scientists have already found that in space conditions, viruses can reactivate. This is the answer. It might be one of the triggers uh, that people, for example, have been infected by viruses, uh, they have had an illness, then the virus became dormant, he was sleeping. And some of the astronauts that went to space, they have experienced uh, this reactivation process. So it's really dangerous. We really want to travel to other planets, but some of the viruses just reactivate. So this process is typically subclinical in astronauts. It, it means that they don't get truly sick and they do not exhibit symptoms, but the presence of active viruses is a good indicator that these astronauts are experiencing reduced immunity during space missions. So we still don't know what happens further. We haven't studied that um, in the long term but we already know that viruses can reactivate just because of space conditions. And the trigger might be radiation, the trigger might be microgravity um, and some other space conditions. So this superpower, uh, I, I would really want to get this one. Uh, now let's think uh, about another thing. Let's brainstorm together. Were you, we all know this virus as well right now. Uh, it's a coronavirus, um, the one that causes COVID-19. And let's think of it as our main character, the happy virus. Uh, what if this virus would escape to space? What do you think, guys? What, what, what would happen if this virus escaped to space? It's a very dangerous virus. What if there are other life forms? Should we be scared about that? Maybe, because uh -huh. um, if it what if it gets like transmitted to another planet and we don't know about it, so then when we go to that planet, maybe the travelers will get infected with COVID again. 
that yeah, would be like another a epidemic. Months of quarantine, multiple tests, vax people go get go there, and then there's a Martian adapted version that kills everyone. But yeah, we can imagine that maybe. Um, um, did you want to say anything, Aria? Because uh, you you was you were also talking. Oh no, I'm good. Thanks. Oh, okay, okay. So yeah, it could be the one of the things. Uh, the virus uh, could uh, one of the things that would might happen to this coronavirus that due to space conditions, it could evolve even more, and maybe it could gain immunity to these space conditions. It could travel to another planet. There are always a possibility. We don't know which direction the evolution goes. So it could be really dangerous if there are other life forms. Maybe. Uh, we just still haven't found the microorganisms in Mars and they are similar to our life. And if this coronavirus escapes to Mars, maybe it would just kill the life forms they haven't found yet. And they're similar to us. So that would be a really bad thing. But let's go back from this happy virus that we talked about, which, which was sent out to space um, uh, in the story. And let's think about the lonely, sad virus from another planet. So in this story, it turns out that it evolved on a volcano and during an eruption escaped their home planet. This is completely hypothetical, but let's just think that it's true. Uh, evolved in a volcano, escaped during eruption. And now these extraterrestrial viruses are on their way, on their way to us humans. Uh, they're traveling from another planet. They can survive space conditions and they're traveling uh, to Earth. So it seems like a bad and dangerous things. And there's another question that I have. Um, and I want you guys to uh, talk about that. So do you think we should be scared? Um, so Vicky covered some of the topics about that. But ultimately, would you guys be scared and why? I see the answer. Yes, viruses are scary. Maybe they're the reason we have evolved. Uh, life has emerged. Um, it, it, it makes uh, me paint a better picture of them. Does anyone have any other ideas? Out of 100%, 100%. So do, you wouldn't be scared, probably. So there we have like diverse opinions. I don't know, uh, because right now it's not a real threat, but could be in the future. Yeah, it could totally be in the future. Um, I'd still be a paranoid. Uh, these are all legit answers and uh, that's just the way we think. Um, so I wanna tell you that while we were discussing um, these two viruses, the happy one and a sad one, actually met each other. Remember in our story, um, the humans have sent the happy virus to space. And um, during the volcano eruption in a distant planet, the sad virus was also sent out to space. And they have been traveling um, and met somewhere further away out of the solar system. Um, this is uh, how the story goes. What do you think, guys? What are the possible outcomes here? if an earthly virus and extraterrestrial virus could meet um, each other just in space. You can just get creative here and uh, we're creating a story, so it could be anything. Well, maybe there's three outcomes. There's one, they aren't able to detect one another because they are too different. Two, they are similar, so they combine to form a more powerful virus. Or three, they destroy each other because they're different. Okay, uh, uh, I really like this. Does anyone have any other, other, other ideas? But I'll um, just collaborate on the second point a bit if others don't have any ideas. Sad There's is jealous. Some, some okay. Go on. I've heard someone talking. There are some responses in chat. Okay. 
I'll just check. Okay, they become friends. It could be one of the outcomes. What if they fall in love and merge to create another virus? So um, uh, it, it connects to Quinn's second point that they might be similar. They could combine, but they have already evolved somehow and they have survived space conditions. So they're basically immortal and they can communicate and they start communication in space. Uh, this is just one of the outcomes. It could be mind blowing, you know, um, so they could actually combine. I really love this idea here. And uh, they could fall in love and merge and create um, another type of virus. Uh, we're totally going to the direction that viruses are alive here because they can uh, create other forms. Viral replication. Gasp, immortal viruses, real bad tardigrades. Uh, oh, goodness. Okay, so the story is shifting to the, towards a bad uh, side. They could, they're basically mortless, uh, immortal, and they can just take over the space. Maybe, maybe that's one of the, uh, one of the outcomes. So actually, um, there are many things, and in, it will be connected to some of the homework that our team has for you guys. Uh, it's a it's a creative task. You just uh, have to think of uh, of some of the things. I'll explain it in, in a bit. But you'll just have to create um, a story uh, based on this um, outline that we have just presented. It was uh, the story that we have created together while brainstorming while while talking. What could happen? But I want you guys to create your own story. Um, it could be written. It could be painted. It could be um, something graphic, um, it could be a comic, uh, anything you come up with, um, you'll, we will send you a link um, of a Google form and you'll be able to submit it to us. So I just want you all to create a story of what would happen if two viruses, uh, one is um, earthly, one is extraterrestrial, one is happy, another one is sad. What would happen to them if they met each other? I came up with one of the ideas, um, and you guys actually mentioned that a bit. So it could be the reason that the sad virus was looking um, for friends and he, he didn't have any friends. And he finally met this happy virus that taught him what happiness is. And maybe in space conditions, they have lived happily ever after. And they were just like traveling around the space, creating a new form of life which is called not life, not, not dead, but maybe another uh, thing that you can guys come up with in a story. It's like another name, a third thing that's uh, something between life and non-life. So there could be many endings to a story, but I just thought that they could be, um, uh, the sad virus could turn into the happy one and they could live happily ever after. So this is what type five virus. Yeah, it could be anything. So I want you guys to think about this homework as a very creative task. Just um, make a story of your own. Uh, we're really looking forward because you were very communicative and had a lot of ideas. So it was basically the end of our um, sto story of our lecture. Um, we have given you some basic information of how, what viruses are, how, how they act to uh, environment, how they act to different things. And now we just came up with the story of two viruses. So we're really glad that you talked with us. Uh, we hope it was interesting to you. Don't forget about the homework. Uh, I, hope it's, uh, I hope it's going to be a nice task for you guys. But we're once again really thankful for participating and listening about um, astrovirology. So space influ influenza is here um, and um, feel free to contact us if you want. Uh, you, we, uh, we can give you our emails. Uh, if you guys want to ask any questions or anything, uh, just um, write in the chat. So we're going to quickly give you a link to Google Forms or I, I, I didn't see Vicky, maybe you can put it in because I can't see the chat right now. Um, but yeah, uh, so that's it guys. I'll stop sharing my screen right now. I'll send it again if you miss it. Yeah, thanks, Vicky, a lot. And thank you, Vicky and Madeline, uh, uh, as well. Um, it was really nice to present this. And thanks for the opportunity, guys. You're amazing. Yeah, thank you guys so much. So we still have 
I guess, five minutes left. So if you guys have any questions um, you want to ask us, feel free to put it in the chat or unmute yourself. But um, if you're good to go and you have the link to the Google form, you can just leave the meeting. So thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for the uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, everyone enjoyed it and everyone learned a lot. Uh, so if any one of you have any question regarding the homework, please uh, let us know right now. Or uh, maybe you guys can share your email addresses in the chat and they can email any one of you to contact if they need help with the homework. everyone for uh, becoming part of this session for uh, actively participating for asking questions and for sharing your knowledge we'll see you uh, next week and next week is going to be our last session thank you so much everyone bye everybody bye bye Sorry, I just wanted to clarify, will there be a session today at, at uh, in, a, in two hours or no? No, no there were some technical issues, so yeah. Okay, we good. We just have one session no. today, yeah. Thank you, thank you. It was wonderful, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to listen and to watch. <laughs> Thank you for giving us the opportunity to present. I know. It's really fun yeah. to research and talk about. Uh, this is a wonderful, uh, very exciting new science, right? Uh, I think the first time they introduced the term like in 2019. Oh, so yeah. So new. Yes. Mm -hmm. It was a little difficult. It made it a little bit difficult to research, but it also made it really interesting because as a, a scientist, or at least someone who would like to consider them, selves a uh, future scientist maybe because I'm still kind of young. Uh, it's it's really interesting to look at all these like possibilities and theories that we don't actually know yet and and get to think about it like before you get the answer. Because a lot of times <laughs> nowadays like you research something and it's just immediately like yes or no, this is what we found. But for astrovirology it's really cool and a lot of new young scientists can enter it and it's like it's very it's a very exciting new field. Mm -hmm. Absolutely and, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah and I feel like it was really easy to just let the kids know that we don't know anything. <laughs> it's really <com> <laughs> like I know that because I know that you were stressing that in some of our prep meetings to like let them know where scientists are still doing research. I'm like, we honestly don't even know if they're alive or not. So we're just out here <laughs> doing our best, <laughs> but it's we don't know a lot. So yeah, but I think it I think it really um, sparks the imagination, and they really liked Ivers's idea of the storyline, and I'm really excited for the Google form and to give you guys that at the end to see what the kids come up with. So. Yes, yes, yes. Not all the kids will reply in the Google form, just so you know, because yeah, okay. they really, <laughs> they really love, you know, the event itself. But then they run to do other things. So, but um, that's okay. Um, but I, I think it was wonderful, and uh, this is again such a wonderful topic because no one knows anything about it, right? But we have all these questions and kids can contribute to the questions. They actually feel a part of the science community. Um, Absolutely, I think as a, a child who used to ask, ask like a million questions in all my science classes, I think it's, it's really important to hear the questions kids ask because a lot of times they're dismissed as like, oh, kids must have stupid questions. But a lot of times they actually point out like really good things. Like kids are smart, kids are they curious. <laughs> <laughs> kids are like so capable i i think that's just like i think it's really important to to like teach kids and, and get their input sometimes as well absolutely 
Yes. I was asked you wanted to say. Uh -huh. I, I'm like speechless. There was like so many things happening in the chat. It was so wonderful to see them communicating. And I, I'm like, yeah, I'm I'm ha I'm a happy virus now. <laughs> 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 yeah, so so thanks a lot for the opportunity. I loved it. Yeah. Well, I'm so happy that you liked it. <laughs> Um, I actually did have a quick question, and I probably should have asked this in a prep meeting, but I thought that there would be another session today. So I have only been to three meetings so far, and I don't know if I'll be able to do the fourth one because next Friday I'm on a plane. So it, how is there, are there, I know these are recorded. Where right. are they somewhere that I can watch them to be able to write reflections on four? Yes, we have all the recordings and uh, the links to the Google folder with all the recordings mm -hmm. uh, is in Slack. So, oh, okay. Yes. Okay. I have actually tried to check the links and I've only, only found the um, recordings for prep sessions. No, no, no. There, there are all the recordings there. So I'll put the links in, in, uh, in the Slack again, just in case. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. I was, I was planning on the 10 a.m. one today being my final one. And then I was like, oh no, it's, it's not happening. <laughs> so, um, so thank you. Thank you for that. Oh yeah. How long should our um, self-reflection for this be? Sorry, now so, we're just taking the opportunity to ask you questions, but. Right, right, right. Uh, we, we have uh, all, all the guidelines there as well, if you right. want uh, to, to see. It's, it shouldn't be much, uh, but uh, probably half a page to a page. Um, and then, and then for our own reflection on ourselves, I think it's a full page, but for the uh, other ones. Yes, for, for the other ones, like half a page is fine. Okay. Yeah, of course, Perfect. this is the one time that my um, polls didn't work. Murphy's Law, right? <laughs> Zoom always somehow does something that it's like, oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wondered why, because the polls um, seem to work so far. But, you know, things happen. That, that, that's why, that's why you should be ready, you know. So, mm -hmm. uh, but no, no, I, th I think it worked very smoothly. And you were very well prepared and it was so interesting. The topic was amazing. The transitions were great. I, I think you did extremely well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, space influenza, good team. Yes, yes, yes. Space yes. <laughs> I think lots of people would actually love to see it. I don't know, uh, would you be fine if we share the recordings like with the world? Sure. Yeah, I wouldn't mind. Yeah, totally. Yeah, Graham was thinking about posting some recordings on Blue Marble site uh, after we're done with the program. What do you think? Uh, yeah, we, I, would love, I would love it to be sent out there. Let the Maybe. people learn about astrovirology. Maybe yes. maybe we'll get more people interested and then get some answers. Yeah. Yes. I'm honored you yes. think our presentation was well prepared enough to post. I think it was beautiful. Yes, I think it was wonderful. Rabia, what do you want to say? Yes, uh, I'm, I'm totally on board with this idea that we should upload all the recordings on our uh, BMS uh, YouTube channel so everyone can mm. see it. Yeah. And I think it will help us to gain a little bit more following on our YouTube channel. Yeah, That's because true it's so too. interesting. Yeah. And you know, lots of parents, they talk to me after this classes. They say, you know, you do it all for kids, but we parents also want to know what's going on. <laughs> Educate <laughs> us. <laughs> I would feel that way if I was a parent yeah. and my child was coming up with all these crazy things that I never thought of, you know, that they learned. I'd be like, what? I want to know about this too. <laughs> so. Yes, they say they come from these classes and they talk, you know, during the dinner time. They ask their parents all these questions, and the parents say, Now I have to educate myself about space and astrobiology. <laughs> so the kids serve as astrobiology ambassadors, they actually make adults interested. That's all, that's all we can ever ask for. Okay. Well, thank you so much again for the opportunity. I do have to run to work, so I'm going to leave. But thank you. It was great. Thank I you. loved it. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you so yeah. much. Goodbye. Uh, bye, everyone. And thank you once again. Yeah. Bye. Thank, thank you. you for the opportunity. It was really great. Wonderful. Have a good weekend. You. you too.
think right we still have michael and zaina goodbye zaina goodbye michael <laughs> rabi i also need to run right now so patel okay. Contact you a bit later. Okay. Goodbye. Goodbye.